This is Green Seas, the podcast by Tradewinds about sustainability and the business of the ocean. I'm Eric Priante Martin. And today, we're going into the belly of a giant cruise ship to talk about Carnival's efforts to tackle its climate impact and rain in waste. So again, most of this is bacteria yeah. that's died doing what we want them to do. At Port Miami, we're in the area of a cruise ship that most passengers will never see. Perhaps they'd never want to. It's called, it's called the dissolved air flotation system. Again, remember we mix the polymers, yeah. then we introduce pressurized air, and as soon as it hits this tank, all those bubbles want to rise to the surface, and those bubbles carry the whatever has been bound together by the flocculates and coagulants. Yeah. This is the solid side. Carnival Cruise Line's Vice President of Environmental Operations, Richard Pruitt, is showing me the ship's advanced wastewater treatment equipment. This technology takes the ship's sewage and gray water and breaks it down until all that's left is water that can be safely dumped at sea. Okay, it hasn't been disinfected yet, so we're going to try to stay away from that part of it. Executives at Carnival Corporation, the world's largest owner of cruise ships, took me on an extensive tour of this vessel to show me the plethora of ways that this one ship is contributing to the company's sustainability strategy. It was a bustle of activity. At this port call in Miami, the ship was taking on liquefied natural gas, or LNG, as crew members worked in the vessel's recycling center to sort waste and as a biodigester churned in the galley to break down uneaten food. Chief Maritime Officer William Burke told me on the Carnival Celebrations Bridge that climate action and circular economy are the most important elements of the six pillars of the company's sustainability strategy. So the climate action is based on, uh, LNG is a big part of it, but we have reduced our carbon footprint, or excuse me, I should say our greenhouse gas footprint, absolute, by 10% since our peak in 2011 even though we've increased our capacity by 30% during that time. So what that tells you is we've gotten a heck of a lot more efficient over time, and we, uh, and, and that's starting to translate into uh, real change from, a, from an absolute greenhouse gas perspective. Burke said the company is on track to achieve a 40% carbon intensity reduction by 2026, and that's a goal of the International Maritime Organization for Shipping in 2030. Carnival has significantly reduced its particulate emissions, and most of its ships are geared up to connect to shore power. On the circular economy, he said Carnival has a goal of having 75% of its ships with those advanced wastewater treatment systems by 2030, and it's also headed for hitting that target four years early. And he said that the waste reduction treatment and recycling efforts are not driven by regulation alone. The regulatory goal for sewage is much, much less than what we're doing. Yeah. The regulatory goal for bilge water is about what we're doing. The ballast water is about what we're doing. The food waste and the digesters and the single-use plastics, there's nothing around that that is a requirement other than you can discharge food waste at sea, but we've taken it a step further, so there's less to do. Carnival's sustainability strategy is not for everyone. Environmental groups take aim at its reliance on LNG, as the fuel's main ingredient is methane, which is a more potent greenhouse gas when it leaks out of ships' engines or in the upstream supply chain. But the cruise giant has clearly come a long way since 2016. That's when Carnival's Princess Cruises subsidiary pleaded guilty and agreed to a $40 million fine for dumping oil-contaminated waste from a ship and then covering it up. The conviction that came the next year included a five-year period of probation that put Carnival's company-wide environmental compliance system under close monitoring which followed a similar probation that started in 2002. Today, we're gonna walk around the Carnival celebration to see how those efforts have played out on this ship. But first, here's a message from Tradewinds Technology Editor, Craig Eason. Hiya, Craig here. I just want to take a minute to tell you about Wavelength, a new podcast from Tradewinds. It's a weekly dive into some of the top news as seen from the Tradewinds editorial staff with insights from experts within our industries. So, to keep your finger on the pulse of the shipping and maritime sectors, search for Tradewinds Wavelength on Spotify, Acast, or any of the podcast platforms that you use, and then click to follow or subscribe. 
or you can visit tradewindsnews.com and search for podcasts there too. That's Tradewinds Wavelength Podcast, a new weekly podcast for both subscribers and non-subscribers alike. The first thing I noticed as I was boarding the Carnival Celebration was the stack of containers that provide the ship with electricity when it's here in Port Miami. And Carnival Corporation has already reached its 2030 goal of outfitting 60% of its fleet with shore power capabilities. In its latest sustainability report, the company said it reached 64% by the end of 2023. Pruitt told me that Carnival is committed to deploying ships with shore power capabilities wherever ports can provide it. But in the region where the Carnival celebration trades, the major destination market of the Bahamas and the Caribbean, that's not an option except when in Florida's ports. They're, they're having to provide power for their own needs, and a ship is very episodic. So a ship comes in and says, I need 8.7 megawatts, and all of a sudden there's that demand. And then eight hours later, the ship leaves, it goes down. So from a, from a standpoint of utilities, it's, it's a difficult thing, especially for an island nation. And, and then you have to remember, shore power is only as good as the source power. So if they're burning a diesel, you're, you're gaining nothing. You're actually, you're actually hurting yourself because you have, you have losses in the connection and transmission. On the opposite side of the carnival celebration, we found the tug Q Ocean Service and its LNG barge delivering 1,100 cubic meters of the fuel, an operation it carries out every Sunday. Carnival executives expressed frustration with the backlash that LNG has faced. They acknowledged that the fuel is not perfect, but they argued that there's a lack of greener alternatives at scale, with limited supply of biological feedstocks and renewable electricity supply, to provide the industry with all the green fuels that it would need to meet its decarbonization goals. Here's William Burke. So LNG is, from a shipping perspective, it's the best fuel out there today. There is, uh, you know, it's, it's better than the heavy fuels or the marine gas oil that we, that we typically use because it's got a better greenhouse gas footprint. Now, the one other benefit that's come out of this it, is it's cheaper than marine gas oil today. But, you know, there are, there's many other things besides the greenhouse gas footprint. There's no particulate that or relatively little particulate co- comes out of LNG. Um, you know, so those are the those are We're the also tier three not compliant yeah. without any after treatment. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's a good point. So that allows us to operate in different parts of the world where they may yeah. have that that restriction. So it's but I. It's the best thing that exists today, and it'll probably be the best thing that exists for the next 10 to 20 years. Because, because, you know, a lot of people talk about green methanol. There's not a lot of green methanol out there. There's a lot of brown methanol, which comes from LNG. And so today, methanol, brown methanol has a, a higher greenhouse gas footprint than, than LNG. The other thing about, you know, should methanol win the the battle over time, an LNG ship can be converted to methanol. So we're sort of future-proofing ourselves. It can't go the other way around easily. And what about those methane emissions from cruise ship engines? This is Tom Strang, Senior Vice President of Maritime Affairs at Carnival Corporation. We've seen a massive improvement in the last four to five years in the design of engines. You know, our latest ship, the Sun Princess, which was delivered a couple of months ago, she has the next generation of engines with a methane slip that is far, far better. But methane slip can be solved. We know how to solve methane slip now. When we first started with these ships and these engines, you know, we weren't we weren't looking at greenhouse gas emissions. We were looking at local emissions, not SOX and PM. That was what we were being criticized for. Now we know that there's an issue with methane slip. We've always known there's an issue with methane slip, but we never realized it was going to be as provocative, as concerning to some of the NGO community. So what we're doing at the moment is we've just done some, we're in the process of looking at what the actual results are. Once we know what those are, once we've measured them, then we can make the improvements. On one of Carnival ships, for example, a trial is underway that will measure the impact of using a catalyst to remove methane from the vessel's exhaust. Prominently displayed for Chief Engineer Fabien Gervais and his team in the engine control room, and then for Captain Vincenzo Alcaraz and his bridge officers, I saw computer screens that show the changing regulatory requirements that the Carnival Celebration will encounter on its voyage. Those screens are the LR OneOcean Enviro Management software platform, developed by the cruise giant 
and Classification Society Lloyd's Register, Carnival recently announced that the platform has now been fully deployed across its fleet. Seeing the regulatory landscape in real time allows for better decision making, according to the ship's captain. This is, uh, helps uh, the officers to do not make mistakes because uh, what happened, they have the real uh, time situation, which is uh, it's very important because sometimes, uh, you, you know, it's, we, we are human beings, we all make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, uh, this is uh, happened because we don't have the right tools. This is a great tools because it gives you real time the officers uh, uh, they, uh, where they are and what they can do and what they cannot do it. Key to Carnival's decarbonization strategy is energy efficiency, with a program of what it calls surface power packages that are being rolled out across the fleet. Within the vast machinery space and engine room of the Carnival celebration, hundreds of inverters contribute to energy efficiency by, for example, allowing pumps to operate on variable speeds. That's what, one of the things that we're doing to try to get more efficient across the entire organization. So you can do that on a, an actual pump motor. You can put a, uh, a variable speed motor on there, and so that allows you to, to run the pump at the right speed rather than either on or off. And so when you, when you do that hundreds of times across the ship, not just on, on pumps, but on fans, uh, it's tremendous saving. We've got a thing called a service power package where we upgrade our um, HVAC equipment, do, do this kind of uh, variable speed drives, and a couple other things, and we think we're going to save 5% across our entire fleet. Pruitt pointed to heat exchangers and vacuum steam evaporators that tackle the ship's waste heat and more. The evaporators, as well as reverse osmosis equipment, are also used to make potable water for showers, the galley, and laundry. The good news is this ship is completely self-sufficient, so the chief is proud to say that we don't bunker water anywhere. We make our own, and that's important when we're in islands where maybe water scarcity is a problem. We don't need to bunker for our needs. In fact, sometimes when we've had emergencies, we've actually offloaded potable water to the islands, like during hurricanes and things like that. So we can make all the water. This is 600. The ROs are also probably 600. Uh, 50 tons per hour each uh, hour. 50 tons per hour is, oh wow. So 1,200 tons a day per the reverse osmosis equipment. So that puts us at 4,000 tons a day of water we can make. Now we're pretty happy to say that our average guest is only responsible for consuming about 200 liters per person per day. So even on a ship with 8,000 people, that's 1,600 tons of potable water that's consumed every day. We can make 4,000. Among other waste heat equipment, some of Carnival ships have steam turbine generators that can produce clean electricity. We use a lot of waste heat. And these are heat exchangers. So we want to get every, every kilowatt of power out of the fuel that we burn. Pruitt estimates that waste heat recovery can deliver 10% to 20% energy savings. For Burke, doing more to utilize waste heat represents the next key phase of Carnival Corporation's energy efficiency efforts. He told me about it over lunch on the ship. And the second phase will be, at least we think it'll be, um, waste heat. And so we, you know, there are a couple ways we've used waste heat forever. Whatever, what it goes out the stack is very hot, and, uh, and so you can use that to, to boil water and make, and make fresh water. What we now can do is take heat out of almost anything. In another corner of this ship's humming machinery space, Pruitt showed me a chain of treatment equipment that takes sewage and other wastewater and turns it into water that can be safely discharged at sea. The equipment includes a bioreactor where bacteria consume the organic matter. And this compartment is pretty much dedicated to treating all the wastewater on board. Uh, I just saw the acceptance testing, the celebration, basically took their sewage and their gray water and turned it into water that is better than almost any municipal utility in the country. Carnival Corporation has installed the advanced wastewater treatment systems on 70% of its fleet so far. Also among Carnival's sustainability goals is tackling food waste, which the cruise giant wants to cut by 50% in 2030. In its sustainability report, the company said it reached a 38% reduction in 2023. Burke said the efforts include training crew to prepare food in a way that reduces waste. 
and to slash the amount of leftover food on guests' tables, the company eliminated trays, meaning passengers must carry individual plates, making it less likely that they'll be able to take more than they can eat. People can have as much as they want, but if they avoid taking it in the first place, then they, there's less likelihood it's going to be wasted. A smaller plate leads to people putting what they can eat on there. If they come back for more, that's great. But at least they won't, their eyes won't be bigger in their stomachs. In the galley, I could hear a pinging or tapping noise from a machine under a counter. Pruitt opened the ship's biodigester, one of 600 that Carnival has installed in its fleet to organically decompose leftover food. Pruitt said that the biodigesters originally used plastic media, the objects in the machine where the bacteria that consume waste live. But the tapping sound on this day was not plastic, but peach pits, which the ships now use as alternative media. So we need a house. We need a bacteria house for the bugs, and the bugs live on peach pits. So we have, we have purchased tractor trailer fulls of, of peach pits in cans, and, and the, the ships order them just like they order anything else. As Carnival was concluding its probation in April 2022, U.S. Justice Department Senior Litigation Counsel Richard Udell spoke before the court. According to a transcript of the hearing, he sought to remind the company that many of the environmental practices it was taking credit for at the time emerged out of the conviction and subsequent probation. The prosecutor praised the judge overseeing the case for focusing on corporate culture. And he said then-Chief Executive Arnold Donald's recognition that the company's culture needed to change was a, quote, big deal. Officers on board the Carnival Celebration have noticed that change in culture. Irfan Bate is the ship's senior environmental officer, and he works to ensure that crew members throughout the vessel are aware of compliance matters. He told me that every crew member is trained on how they can reduce their environmental footprint. Being in a probation last time was a good opportunity for us. Uh, we took it as an opportunity to improve rather than looking at it as uh, we are being penalized or punished. And which was a good thing because then we could reorganize and we could see and focus on the things which are, uh, I mean, uh, everything is important on board. Uh, but then we, we had a sequence of what all things we have to uh, really focus on. And we did and that is showing a good results now. Now, he said, Carnival crew members are working to standards that are above and beyond environmental regulations. The captain, Vincenzo Alcaraz, has worked on Carnival ships for nearly three decades. And he said the corporate culture has changed 300% since he became a captain 18 years ago. I've been with Carnival for the last 27 years. And, you know, 27 years ago was not uh, like today. Uh, we change a lot, we grow up, uh, uh, we also, the mentality change, uh, the way we see things is a change. To read more about sustainability and shipping, visit tradewindsnews.com slash sustainability and sign up for the Green Seas newsletter at tinyurl.com slash Green Seas. Music for this episode is by Pump Up the Mind from Pixabay.